Okay, well, let's go uh, first things first, uh, just to finish off with um, what we started last class, which was our in-class assignment regarding programming. Uh, was there anybody here right now who was not attending last class? Was, oh, okay, yeah. but you were able to do some of this on online. Okay, fantastic. All right. So uh, that's great. So all of you made a start on it <coughs> last class. And then um, uh, those who are streaming, uh, some participated adequately through chat, uh, some didn't. So in terms of live streaming, I'll have to send out another clarification about this. First time we're doing this like hybrid approach. Uh, for So I'm speaking not to you folks who are in the room right now, but to those who might be streaming this or consuming it afterwards. So uh, you folks should do the online version of the in-class assignment television programming, which is right here on the module for this, uh, this week, right? So uh, that should be turned in. Now, I, I guess to the folks who are in this room, <laughs> we, we didn't finish up on the cable side of this last class. And uh, the, anyway, it was not going to be something we could really comfortably do in class because the, the data that we had was in a form that was really impossible for me to print out and hand out so you could work on it. So, so uh, um, now to everybody, uh, you, should, you should at least do the cable part and submit it at the prompt. And Richard pointed out that it said the deadline was September 19th, but don't worry, submit it. There won't be any late penalties, OK? So wh what are you turning in then? Well, for folks who didn't participate in class or uh, adequately through chat, you would be turning in the network part of this, uh, which was just looking for different network strategies that we talked about. Uh, but everyone who is in class did fine on that. And so what you'd be turning in online is the second part of this, which was to create a cable package uh, targeted at a particular demographic, which would be defined by age, gender, uh, and perhaps some psychographics in terms of what their interests are. Uh, and uh, you had a budget of $11.95, and you could go picking cable networks from the list that was up here, which was a current list having 2017 cable carriage fees for those networks. And so uh, um, if you didn't get that done, get it done uh, ASAP and, and submit it at the prompt there. So it would simply be, you know, give me a list. First, give me a couple of lines about who's your demographic, what is this package for. Uh, give me a list of what goes in there, totaling up to less than 11.95, and then in a sentence or two, say, why did you pick, you know, uh, the particular network that you put in there? Why did you pick that one? How did it connect to the demo? So those of you who've done this already, can you share with us, uh, like, how was it? Was it uh, frustrating not to have enough money, or I don't know, Jonathan? No, it was fairly easy. Uh, the most expensive. Uh, products there were the sports packages, yeah, and they're they're usually like seven bucks or something like that. But you compare that to everything else. I'm not a sports guy, so I don't normally watch that. So I'm normally watching either movie channels or just uh, channels that have you know whatever sitcom, comedy, entertainment. So I made a what I call the essentials package for anybody that was trying to downgrade to a lower ah, uh, cost or to a or just a early or new per, new uh, customer. And just wait, this is just an essential package. So I had. FX, TBS, Cartoon Network, Comedy Central, all the music channels, all your you know, okay. basic channels, and then that added up to like $9. Oh, cool. And so I was like, cool, I'm in the profit, I'm in the green. So right, right, absolutely. <laughs> your, your carrier will make more money on that. Yeah. That's cool. Okay, great. Anybody else do it? But yeah? Um, I did, did a couple of days ago, and my target was middle class men and women finishing work. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay. So a lot of these stations that I put in, uh, TBS, who usually has Family Guy, American Dad, um, Psych, <coughs> Modern Family, mostly comedies, but I did add in some NFL, ESPN stuff as okay. well to have some, uh, the theme was sit back, relax, and be chill. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Best way to put that. Um, most of this stuff, though, was really unisex. Most people would Equally interesting to all people, yeah, okay. Yeah, um, yeah, there were some parts that were more situated with women, uh, like E! News, Botched, 
which is a lot of. Uh, I don't know if people yeah. uh, change uh, <laughs> like they want to change their oh, nose. The, oh, the TV show botched. Yeah. Oh, okay. Is this like botched plastic surgery? Yes. Like the, oh, yes, it geez. is. <laughs> yes. Or stains okay. to the dress. And so there's a whole cable. There's a whole cable channel devoted to like bad plastic problem? surgery going wrong. Um, that one's on E. <laughs> That's on E. That's on E. Oh, okay. So okay. So a lot of this would go, or NFL. I would definitely watch that after work for sure. <laughs> there's like fun. Bosch is fun now. <laughs> There's like entire channels for cupcake competitions. Oh, like there's wow. everything. Amazing. Amazing. So I put down that uh, several of these shows can be funny, dramatic, or romantic. Okay. So I wanted to add in more unisex. I see. Variety. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's that's totally legit. That sounds interesting. And it all came up to exactly 11.95. Oh, okay. Good for you. All right. You used all your money. That's cool. Okay. So. So those are those are both good examples of what you could come up with, and uh, you know there's also an example I put up there, which is more targeted at a, at a younger younger audience. But yeah, yeah. JP. I was thinking maybe <coughs> I don't think I did too good on this one, but a channel for just like women ages 18 to 34 who are interested in like true crime or drama or like the latest news. Mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. like three the three lifetime networks. Because they have a lot of true crime stuff, but they also like drama. <laughs> and then I picked Investigation Discovery, because that's true crime. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yes. Crime and Investigation Network, and Oxygen, because they actually recently switched to all crime format from like mm. reality. It's definitely an up and coming genre of programming. Yeah. True crime is like, it's got a big audience. Okay, cool. Yep, sounds good, JP. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I look forward to hearing what you guys came up with. It's very cheap. It's like 85 cents. Oh, really? Whoa. You're making lots of money. OK. <laughs> OK. So we'll see. Yeah, I, I wanted to, I put probably like 11.95 is a lot of money. But anyone who wanted to put sports in there found that, you know, it's because of the, you know, the licensing fees to, to deal with the, the uh, sports, um, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, you know, to go to the NFL, you're spending a lot of money. So that's that's why those cost so much. But uh, a lot of, you know, with the unbundling, then, you know, I mean, ESPN has been, um, the stock has not been doing very well. Like it used to be just the, you know, a constant money maker for Disney. And now it's really the only part of Disney which is in trouble. Uh, and. Part of that is just, uh, you know, with, with the unbundling of the cable offering, um, it's harder and harder just to get people to pay for ESPN who don't really want it. And so that, I think, is the investors looking ahead and saying, OK, you know, you can no longer just count on ESPN being in every cable operator's lineup and just pulling in that money all the time. So, so we'll see how that develops. Um, did anybody do deal with Viacom shows? Like, did you look at um, Viacom is being a lot in of, big trouble? Of yeah. Did you, Richard? Yeah. I mean, there are so many there, and that's been an issue. A, a lot of, I mean, Viacom has been in a lot of trouble, in part because of war among the the Redstone family. Sumner Redstone was the head of of <coughs> Viacom for. A long time, which is it's had a long uh, history of involvement with CBS as well. Currently, they're separate entities, but uh, um, some, somewhere up the chain, they come together. But if you look at all the spin-offs of, you know, you know, you, you know I mean, the the tentpole Viacom companies, you know, would be BET, Comedy Central, uh, Nickelodeon, MTV has seen much better days, obviously. But then you've got all the spin-offs, you know, BET Hip Hop, BET Gospel, B, you know, all of those are due for a, a, a you know, consolidation and a contraction there because there's, there's just too much happening there um, is, is, is the general view. Uh, so, yeah. The, the, these, this, this data could be interesting for beyond this. OK, so you guys know that I'm hoping you'll turn that in as soon as you get that done. And hopefully that would be soon. And why did I just, everything just disappeared there, didn't it? I got any, <laughs> nope. 
Come back, come back to me. <laughs> what happened? Okay, oh, darn. All right, well, let's come back. What I wanted to talk to you now is the upcoming term paper next Tuesday. Uh, and we should talk about this. Gino, you had a question? Is there a significant difference between MLA and APA format? Because I'm not familiar with APA, so. Uh, for this essay, it's almost irrelevant, the differences. So there, there are differences. Uh, but, you know, I'm not even necessarily requiring a bibliography at this point. So that's where the major differences would be. Uh, so I can put some links to, uh, let's see, OWL, APA. I mean, the amount of formatting that you're going to have to do is so, so minimal that um, here would be an example. So I can put a link to this. And, uh, yeah, so... Um, I wouldn't worry so much about how it's actually laid out on the page, but let's look. Uh, let's look again at um, <coughs> term paper topics. Oh my God! Here we go. I have to be in uh, student view in order to actually see something in an easy way. Okay, that's really like crazy. But anyway. All right, so let's go. We can get to it through assignments. Okay. So, um, research paper one, and uh, we can also get to the guidelines. All right, so this is in two parts. <clears throat> so the guidelines is this, this thing should be a minimum of four pages typed out, 12.1 inch. So, I mean, that would come to about a thousand words if you're just counting words there. My idea is that your primary source of information for this essay would be the textbook. Uh, so if you're using the textbook for your source of information, then you just have to cite the author and the page that it came from. So it would be, uh, uh, you know, textbook page 43 or something like that. Uh, if you find you want to go beyond the information that's in the textbook, and sometimes there's only like a couple of lines about what interests you, so then you can bring in outside sources. Um, I'm open to, you know, lots of outside sources. <coughs> but if, if you bring those in, you should do a bibliography and cite them in the bibliography. So again, I'll, I'll put up a link to, you know, a site like this, which would basically say, okay, if you, uh, you know, uh, cite an electronic source, this is how you should write it, you know, so it would be there. Um, so I don't expect you, there's no minimum number of sources for this assignment. One would be the textbook, and that's, you know, beyond that is, is your choice. So you probably won't have to do a whole lot of work putting together a bibliography if, if that's the case. You know, we can, uh, later on in the semester, there's a second term paper, and we can do sort of more, perhaps, preparation about research sources and stuff later on after the midterm. Right now, we're sort of rushing full speed ahead. Um, so some of the other general uh, asks here are that you turn it in as a doc or a docx or a PDF, because I can't read pages. So uh, be sure to do that. Um, and uh, if it's late, I'll accept it for sure. It'll just be a, a small penalty for being late. But if it's more than two weeks late, um, then you really better talk to me and explain why you couldn't get it in, you know, within within that time. Okay. So those are those are the general uh, uh, requirements. And now now you know more specifically, you can pick one of these four topics. And uh, there's some interpretive leeway here. But we have tried to throw out at least some basic ideas about each of these. And you know, again, I could re repeat some of my ideas about these, about you know, how, how I was thinking about why these would be interesting. So I was just talking to Olive, and probably some people were overhearing our, we were talking about this prompt, which was discuss the impact that the network system had in developing a national culture. And pertinent areas would be advertising, entertainment, and political broadcasting. You may discuss either the early days of radio or the early television networks. Uh, so, you know, 
the first thing you want to do on any of any topic that you're writing on is think through, you know, what is the prompt actually asking, and in terms of the concepts that are used there, what you know, what what am I supposed to be doing? Like, what is a national culture? So that was something I tried to explain a little bit about. But here's the idea again: if you put yourself back to 1918 or whatever, just at the at the beginnings of uh, a mass electronic mass media. You know, you're, you're in a culture which is much more local, where it takes much longer for information to travel from one place to another, uh, where, you know, slang, dialects, you know, those aspects of, of, of local cultures are much stronger, perhaps, than we know today. Uh, and you're looking then maybe 10, 15 years later, thanks to radio and the incredible diffusion of radio receivers and the rise of radio networks and stuff, now you're getting the number one entertainment and information medium in the country is tying large groups of people together across great big geographic distances. They're consuming the same information at, in a synchronous fashion at the same time. Uh, in addition to that, we were talking about, uh, you know, more specifically about in political broadcasting. Uh, you know, the, the, the radio brings sort of an, the possibility for informal chat between the president and uh, the, all the listeners, uh, jumping over the news media gatekeepers that existed even then, uh, and so on and so forth. So there's a huge change in terms of just simply the synchronous temporal aspect and the way that a whole country could now be exposed to the same information, stars, et cetera. And of course, at the same time, you have the film industry moving all those movie star images around and exposing all audiences to those folks as well. So, so that's a big change. And when we talk about a national culture, what we mean is a culture that's not just in little local pieces, but is literally something that everybody in the United States is exposed to. You know? So to me, the huge contrast would be in early radio broadcasting, which Does is good also look at TV. Yes, please. Let's okay. let's four pages, right? We can't cover the whole world. Sure. Pardon me. Because it, it's brought up in the book about war, like the not Vietnam War, but one of the wars. Yeah. Um, and we could hear over the radio about what's going right. on. Right, Edward R. Murrow. Yeah. Well, if you were writing about television and you wanted to talk about political broadcasting, I think you could bring that in there. You know, in the sense that it's a huge political issue to go to war. And when you've got an incredibly compelling broadcaster, like literally broadcasting while the bombs are dropping around, you know, our allies in England, <laughs> that probably has a pretty strong effect on audiences. You know, it's like maybe we should get involved. You know, versus just oh, the occasional newspaper comes out and it's like another 10,000 dead in London. It's like I'm sure they cared, but to have somebody there, you know, that immediacy of it, I think, is something you could deal with. Uh, so, Richard, you had your hand up a while back. Yeah. So. Um so you know how like the first broadcasting was in New York and then the first, you know? Cam, I was thinking about relating it to recent times as to how President use, uses his media to communicate with people. Can, I, can we, are we allowed to do that or is it? Like, yeah, yeah, I think so. Olive had a similar question. Can I bring it forward to the present day? And if you have room, then I think you could, you know? If we're talking about the FDR fireside chats as, you know, jumping over the news media, you can see, you know, current presidents and, and recent presidents who've all done the same sort of thing, you know. Yeah. So yeah, that would be I'm I'm happy for you guys to make those kind of connections for sure. And this this gives you a little idea about structure in that you could take advertising, entertainment, and political broadcasting sort of one at the time. And your textbook has enough information in it about what the beginnings of advertising were, what, you know, uh, you know, it, there's plenty, especially about early radio broadcasting. But if you want to do it on TV, I think you could. The only thing is the contrast is not so huge at that point because when TV comes around in 48 to 52, you know, the country is already, you know, wired together through radio and there is a national culture. And, and, you know, so, but, but go ahead because it says you can. <coughs> All right, any questions about that prompt? So that's, again, that's how I'd think about it. That's how I'd go through it. Uh, who's interested in another prompt that we could, instead of me going through all these? Yeah, Corey? Question. Uh, the first one, the Fox UPN WB, is, that's pretty much the programming strategies is like the, are we referring to like the blocking and the, 
Yeah, yeah, and it would it would it would extend even further and perhaps be less specific than the programming strategies that okay. we just you just mentioned there. In the sense that, I mean, and here I would draw on probably the Wikipedia pages for Fox and for maybe CW, and then continue out maybe if if you need more information that's not in the textbook, I would look at uh, certain industry publications, so Variety. Uh, the Hollywood Reporter. Um, uh, what else? Uh, there's a cable trade. I don't know. You could keep looking, but these these would have a fair bit about it. Just just look up. You know, how did Fox get started? Fox is a great example. You know, they began on Sunday night. They didn't compete. They didn't try to go seven nights a week head to head with the big three. So I think that's an advisory. That's that's something important. Um, they, you know, look at the demographics that they focused on. They were different. Uh, look at the types of programs they put up, which is intimately related with the demographic. You know, if you're going after a certain group of people, you're going to favor a certain type of program. You know, like currently, crime procedurals are great to reach people like 55 and over. You know, but if you're going for a younger audience, you're going to put something else on there. Um, so, so I, I think that with sufficient depth in the discussion, those would already be three major things that you could just look at and learn about, and you would instantly find that what what all of these networks did is quite different than what the big three do. By the big three, we mean ABC, CBS, NBC, which tend to reach out to older audiences and you know deliver to their affiliates. A you know a huge menu of shows for clearance, versus uh, a Fox might come on with a, a more limited uh, schedule to leave the local stations more time to show syndicated programming and stuff like that. So that's another thing you could look at is the balance of syndicated to original programming. You know Fox has caught up, but in the early days, you know it's it's whatever. That's that's plenty to get started with. Plenty to start out with. And, and I would say, I, I would focus either on Fox or on the CW and then think, I mean, if you happen to have a lot of knowledge of the WB because you watched it as a kid or something like that, then go for it. But I don't know how much good information is out there about you know, the WB in particular. And the CW, you can look at now, basically, and understand what it's doing. So, um, Sandra. Right? So. Um, can we use graphics? In our, like charts and stuff. Uh, yeah, if there's something not, that not you really to need the... to. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I tend to prefer put those at the end just so that I can read the whole thing without like yeah. jumping through it. Yeah, because reading online in Canvas is like a bit of a chore. It just doesn't scroll all that well. By the way, how is our how's chat going? <laughs> Sorry, folks. <laughs> that, that reminds me, I shouldn't ignore you all the time. Has chat always been in CCSF system, or was there a different? Uh... Oh well, Canvas is uh, less than a year old, and we had something called Insight before, which I don't think. Uh, Dar Nika says I had more money than I needed for my package. Okay. Yeah, that's good. You're making profit, Nika. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is just a year old, and uh, this is the first time I've had anything like what we're doing here. So we'll see. Okay. Other prompts where we could give you some ideas for how to do Where is this? I'm still in student view. Here we go. Um, OK, so uh, sort of the, this one, the, the radio survivor paper, I, I kind of suggest that, you know, I mean, we all, we, we've, we've said that radio had to reinvent itself after TV went and cannibalized, you know, all of the big stars and many of the Many of the serial program, you know, went over to television, so you were left with radio, and uh, music comes up, and so uh, radio turns to music programming, and uh, <clears throat> so this is an invitation to sort of to to think about how that happened, and then also to think about the current situation where radio is now responding to uh, to the internet, and mobile. So so I think you could you know. Talking about the types of programming that have you know been introduced, talking about 
where the listeners are, you know, physically, they're in their cars, so they're still an, an in there. Uh, that's an important thing to realize. Um, and I think that uh, the textbook has an enormous amount of information about radio formats and stuff, so you could use that. I don't think you'd have to go too far beyond the textbook for this one, for sure. Uh, apart from your own personal experience of what radio is doing now, you know, uh, in response to mobile media and internet. Any questions about that one or ideas that you want to throw out there? You know, always, I, f I tend that I think the more we talk about it in class, the better. And then you go home and he's like, "What did we say in class?" Or uh, you know, hopefully that that has sparked something and give you some ideas. Okay. All right, and then there's this one which we haven't talked about at all. So this one is a compare prime time schedules from different eras, and you could pick the eras, the dates specifically, or whatever. So there is a, there's a link here to the historic prime time stuff, so you could look through TV ratings. What was going on in 1972? Uh, you know, oh, there we go. So. <laughs> There's all of that, you know, Mary Tyler Moore. This is a kind of a proto-feminist show, definitely. Uh, what do we got here? Only on all the movie. three big networks, right? Always sports. Yeah, I mean, we're kind of limited to what was to what they're reporting there. So they just got the big three. Mm. The Partridge Family. Oh my God, I saw that in reruns. So this wouldn't show us anything like uh, the Tonight Show or anything else outside of the Those are outside of prime time, yeah. So we're really just reading the prime time schedule. Because I'd be interested to see those analytics. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure you can find that. Just have to dig deeper. But I don't know exactly where. Is it OK if we talk about that kind of stuff? If you can find you know, the actual data to talk about it, yeah. Okay. So if we look at the prompt here, it says break out the program types, meaning basically, OK, what kind of things are, are on? Uh, and this might be, you know, I mean, I don't expect you to know uh, what all of these shows were, you know. So we had variety shows, we had a medical, we had a family drama, we had a kind of a <laughs> after school, <laughs> the Partridge Family. So you've probably heard of some of these. Uh, so I don't think you have to be totally comprehensive and try to find out, you know, Adam 12, that was a police show, but you may not know it. Maud was a spinoff. Uh, um, who was Maud on before? Uh, all in the Family. All in the, so she was from a Norman Lear universe. Yeah. So And All in the Family, number one. Wow, number one show. 21 million people watching Archie Bunker. Hysterical. Incredible. I mean, it was, it, he's, he's, he can actually be quite moving, too. So, so, uh, so to, to get into the prompt here, what it says is, okay, you know, what type of shows were up there? And then, this is the interesting part. Um, draw conclusions about the type of world that was reflected in television's mirror from each era. So that sounds easy to say. But uh, as, you're, as, you're, as you're looking through it, and you're saying, okay, uh, you know, one of the periods I'm looking at is the early 70s. So All in the Family, number one show. Uh, maybe you want to click in on Wikipedia if you don't know the show. Check it out. What's, what's All in the Family? Uh, could any, it's Mason, right. you watch it? Yeah, I'm sorry. I forget this, what's his name. Really? Archie Bunker? Is his name in real life? Uh, Carol O'Connor. Okay, yeah. but uh, just racist. Uh, <laughs> hated everybody. Right. Uh, talked down to his wife and his kids and hit right. and there you go. It was hysterical. That, that was the difference. Yeah, it yeah. was funny, had, but that was the And he had the neighbors, the Jeffersons. The neighbors, right, yeah. Right, yeah. so he was a working class white bigot. Yeah. And in his family, he had his daughter, who he adored, was married to this sort of, you know, left-leaning 60s... Uh, he was a hippie to Hippie type character, who really was just pretty normal, but... Yeah. He was right. Jewish. Ah, I don't know about that, was he? Okay, so. okay, so more, more to play up the bigoted side. So, you know, there was an intergenerational conflict, which I think at that time you could connect that to the question, okay, so what kind of America is being reflected? You know, it's like about the type of world that was reflected in television's mirror. So, you know, you had there a, a more conservative dad, uh, you know, who clearly was in the white mainstream and felt empowered to be so bigoted towards all those minorities. 
you know, but things are changing, and so the whole show was premised on him just constantly being like buffeted by all these social changes and stuff. And so, I mean, I think that would be an excellent, you know, sort of place to drop in and say, look at the type of show that was popular in that period. And you can, the, the idea is you're trying to sort of explain social history with like the type, types of shows that are out there, you know. So, so I, I could see this as being both really interesting, but also a bit of a challenge, uh, you know, as you have to look in and find out what those shows were about and what, um, you know, what, uh, what was going on in the country. So if you don't feel that you have that information at your fingertips, you know, uh, again, I, I, I feel bad like continually pushing Wikipedia. But I think if you, if you use it critically, there's nothing wrong with it, right? So Wikipedia, Wikipedia actually will t give you kind of an overview uh, decade by decade if you want. So you can look up the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s on Wikipedia. And if you go down into it, I believe there's even specifically articles or sections on television. So you could look in here and get an overview of, you know, at least what they're talking about in terms of TV, you know. And you may find, uh, you know, to reflect social trends, television changed dramatically with urban and edgy settings. Uh, you'll see some of those shows like All in the Family uh, dealt with there. So you really couldn't just use Wikipedia for all your ideas or anything, but if, if you need, you know, to get an overview of what's going on in the country in 1970 because you're not that familiar with it, this would be a great place to start, you know. And, and so there's, there's going to be a section on television in the United States, and also, you know, there's all about what's going on in the country, too, and, and the world. And, you know, so you might be able to connect stuff up that way. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> interesting, huh? All the things that you can get. So, and, uh, and you can, you know, I don't know where the links are to the, there you go, you can get to the 1980s section and so on and so forth. So, I, you know, that might be one way to, to get into the information that you need for that prompt, okay? So, um, so we've talked about some ideas about what the prompts mean, and you've got a general idea of how long it has to be, and formatting, as I said, is, you know, unless you're going to, well, it's, it's pretty simple, I think, formatting-wise. So, so the only other thing I'd say is you have to try and tell a story in this, in this assignment. It's, you know, you, you can get your hands on all the information you need, and, and what you're trying to do is tell a story about the way early radio might have changed the United States or tell a story about, you know, the social history of the United States in three jumps and how television illustrates that in, in, in the prompt we were just talking about. Or tell a story about how a young upstart network beats down the three, you know, uh, uh, what you would call it, incumbents, you know, ABC, CBS, NBC, whether the upstart is Fox or the CW or whatever, you know, plucky upstart and so on. And, and so you're telling a story and it's okay to tell a story. It's actually more fun to tell a story. Okay, so tell a story and pepper it with facts, with the kind of history that will be in those two chapters of your textbook, either radio or TV, and, and bring it up to date if you want. So that could be the, the, the end of the story, could be where we're at now with this particular thing, if you want it to be. You know, it doesn't have to be, but that'd be it. So, uh, so I find that telling a good story will make it more fun and easier to do this. Just getting too many facts is, will swamp you in facts, and you won't know what's the beginning and what's the end of this. So. So pick, pick a relatively accessible story and then go for it, <laughs> all right? And, uh, uh, you know, hopefully it'll, you'll get something good come together by Tuesday. If you don't, I'm still accepting it for a couple weeks afterwards with a late penalty. So uh, but do your best to get it done for Tuesday. Looking forward to see what you write. Let's leave the student view. And I just wanted to 
continue on with, uh, we're going to have a Kahoot at the end, so we've got to leave enough time for that. Um, yes? What, are, we, are we happy or unhappy about a Kahoot? We should be happy. The media writing classes, we, they, they actually provide a web quiz. So the Kahoots have all been in this class. <laughs> Believe me, I'm, I'm horribly aware of these things. Okay. Well, we've been talking about television programming. We kind of have ignored radio programming, and uh, we are not going to be able to deal with it in great depth. Um, but I think anybody listening to radio right now is noticing a couple of trends that music radio programming uh, has become sort of more and more like a kind of an iPod on shuffle or something like that. You're, you're getting playlists that, um, um, that um, are not often interrupted by a live DJ who's actually engaging with an audience. But you are getting more of that in the various forms of talk radio and sports talk that are out there. So I'd say, you know, if we're looking at new trends, the all news, the sports talk, and the news talk is very healthy in terms of, of broadcast radio. And I'd say the top 10 music formats are, you know, just kind of holding on. This would be in terms of the number of stations that are out there in the country. We're talking uh, commercial radio stations. There's somewhere around 10,000 commercial radio stations that are in the country versus about 1,200 television stations, I'd say. So if we look at you know, the, most, the most stations that are out there are dedicated to country and then news talk. So it's still doing OK. Why, why do you think, and this is, this is part of a game, right? There, there is solid data uh, produced by Nielsen. Uh, they know who's listening uh, to what and how old they are and all kinds of information about them. Uh, and we can find some of that out, but also we can just guess, make informed guesses. So an informed guess as to why country might be so, there's so many country stations, basically. Um, like whenever, like every year I'll take a drive out to Nevada and, or go a little bit further than that. And when you leave a city, it's either just uh, Mexican music or country stations. Gotcha. And it's either for the people working or for the people who are farming, the people who are driving. And that's, all that there are are going to be Mexican people and white people where you're going. Literally. In, 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 the, in the southwest. <laughs> yeah, wherever there is in a big city, that's pretty much what you're getting. Yeah. And that music, that's, that's what's there. That kind yeah. of reflects it. Yeah. I, I, you know, uh, absolutely. I think, you know, radio stations cover a particular geographic area. When you get out of the big city centers, which have, you know, we got 40 plus commercial stations in San Francisco alone, right? But you get out, like you say, on the road into more rural places, and the population is thinner. They've got their particular, you know, uh, musical tastes uh, and, or informational tastes, and so you've got more stations that are covering those areas, and they and that type of music appeals to that demographic and, and those those that particular audience. So yeah, makes a lot of sense, and it's related to the way that radio covers a geographic area. And people are often driving there. So radio is still a big deal to have some music in the car. And they maybe don't need their smartphone or something as much as we do. Olive? Well, a uh, good example, my dad lives in the middle of nowhere, Texas. He doesn't have TV. Wow. Yes. So radio is a big thing for him. A lot of people said, wow, yes. Uh, so he listens to radio to get really any information. Right. Like I said, he lives in the middle of nowhere, so he'll be listening to music. Good example. Yeah. yeah. And most people who live in a town like that, maybe 1,200 people, they're not really going to care too much about the news because they live in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where the weather's 90 degrees, so they're going to be listening to music instead to yeah. pass the time away. And, and you're not going to necessarily be giving, have, you can't, you can't afford to put 40 stations there playing, with three of them playing slightly different versions of, you know, urban contemporary or something like that, you know, as we can do here. So over there, you might have one or two stations, and they're likely to, you know, be a clear channel station playing country music, most likely, you know, because that's the way it is. Yeah. All right, so, so these are called formats. And uh, if we look back in the history of radio, 
you know, when television came along and took away all those serial dramas and uh, variety shows and all the things that radio used to be up through the mid 1940s, and we said that you know, radio recovered by turning to play music. And initially, they began to you know, uh, th there was a, they'd play a variety of music and they'd try to have a, a varied. Uh, program schedule throughout the day. So they might play one type of music at a certain time, another type of music later on. But uh, uh, as the business developed into the 1960s, uh, broadcasters came to think that the way to go was to program a whole day a particular type of programming. And they called that a format. So you could spend all day playing sort of easy listening music or you could spend all day playing country music. And uh, so this is the rise of format radio, where a station basically is a, a matter of an identity, takes on you know, a particular type of music and plays it all day long. And uh, they will you know, adapt their station, they call it imaging, so they'll have, all their promos will have that type of music in it. Their DJs will seem to come from that world. You know, they'll have the accent or they'll have the point of view, which is sort of goes along with that type of radio format as well. You know, and it would it would be totally weird to be on a country station and then hear a hard rock commercial or something. You know, yeah. it doesn't happen that way. Everything is kind of homogenized around that format. So. Um, so, so this was a big, big development in, in making radio work and in the way that programming now is basically you'll have a few rock stations in a, in a, in a market like San Francisco. You'll have a few, you know, they call them urban stations, but then it would depend as to whether, you know, if you, the way it used to be anyway, here in San Francisco was the Clear Channel owned uh, you know, they owned uh, KYLD, which was sort of like a party station with high rotation popular music. Uh, they owned KMEL, which was like a, you know, mid 20s to mid 30s type of hip hop station with a certain amount of R&B. And then they had KISQ, so they, they had KISS with Ronell. So they had a celebrity, uh, you know, for, for the older, you know, let's say 35 and up, who was interested in R&B and soul music, basically. So, you know, Clear Channel, with that strategy, they had three differently formatted stations that were basically taking what the business would call urban music, and they were trying to keep the audience, just, just move them up that chain. So as they got older, they'd still be listening to a Clear Channel station, if you like that type of music, you know. Uh, so uh, that, that was clearly a, a, a programming strategy that they had. Uh, so the formats are very well understood. Uh, they're researched. Nielsen does separate research on each of the formats. There's a publication called Radio Today that you can request from their site, which will go across the United States. It'll show you which states, which local markets are, you know, like what, what are they dominated by? What are the top stations there? Uh, if you can click in and find, uh, you know, classic rock, you know, who does it appeal to? Men over 50, you know? And they will break that down. And then there'll even be like sections on, okay, what kind of snacks do they buy? What kind of, you know, did, what kind of cars are they anticipating buying in the next 10 years and stuff like that? So by formatting the music, it pulls a certain audience to the station. And then that station can be, you know, researched and understood. I'm sorry, that audience can be understood, like men over 50, what do they listen to? What can we sell them? And then that station, their sales team can take all of that information out and go to businesses and say, okay, you know, we're the number one classic rock station in San Francisco. Uh, you have a hard time reaching out to those older guys who want to buy, you know, I don't know, X, Y, and Z, whatever, golf clubs or something. So, uh, you know, they'll go to the sporting goods store and they'll say, you know, try, try with us, you know. Uh, a flight, let's, let's sign up for 16 weeks, see how it goes. We'll play your ads, you know, 30 times a day. And at the end of 16 weeks, we'll look at how your sales are doing and we'll see if we can, you know, claim something, you know, claim that we did that for you or whatever. You know. so, so that's how the, why a format of a particular type of music 
will pull, you know, men over 50. Or Alice, you know, which is probably women 24 to 40 something, or something <coughs> like that, you know. So what do we want to sell them? And, and so those formats will be chosen, you know, based on what kind of audience is, is you're after to deliver. Okay, so is, any, any thoughts on that? Any stations that you listen to where you feel like, oh, like that's targeted at those consumers? Yeah, JP? Play like stations. A radio station, maybe. Yeah, like 9.9. Or Cameo. Uh-huh. So you feel it's, it's a t yeah. yeah. I mean, hip hop is almost like the top 40 of the last 10, 15 years. So it's, it's, it, it, it reaches a pretty broad audience like that. Um, what's the, the number one San Francisco station, embarrassingly, is the easy listening uh, KOIT in terms of FM? Yeah, AM, AM is always dominated by a big news station. Uh, but FM, I think, is probably KOIT is almost always on top here. Especially they start playing Christmas music like on the 1st of December. So there's, horribly, that rate's better than anything else. So uh, it's, it's not, it doesn't always deliver the music that everybody wants to hear. That's a weird thing, right? So uh, programming on, on radio comes from a couple of places. It may originate in the radio station itself. So that would cover all your music stations, which would still have you know, a morning team. Uh, you know, and those are fewer and fewer, but they still exist. Or, or an afternoon drive you know, team of real people who you know, talk back and forth and stuff and play music. Uh, another source is uh, uh, networks. So you know your your big your big uh, KGOs or KCBSs, uh, your your big radio AM AM news stations. They get a lot of network programming, a lot of network news that are produced for them, and they play it. Uh, there's also syndicated programs, right? So we saw this a bit with TV, but let me remind you: a syndicated program is not originated by a network. It's a private company that makes a program but then we'll sell it to individual broadcasters. So like we have, uh, we have one in the Bay Area called House of Blues, uh, which is distributed across the country, and they basically produce it here. We get interns working there sometimes, and, uh, and they put together a music show, and they'll, they'll sell it that way. And very often, local stations need something on the weekend, so they'll get syndicated programming on it, put it on Saturday, Sunday morning, or something like that. And for a syndicated producer, what's good about it is you can make the show, and then it's up to you to sell it in as many places as you can. Mm. And you can make your money that way. You can have quite a successful show. Rush Limbaugh is a syndicated producer, right? He's like top of the top of the talk radio. He, so uh, that, that can be. Um, uh, paid for either either you pay outright for the show, or you give away some of the uh, advertising spots that play on that show. So you might make a deal where House of Blues, uh, all all you know they'll they'll leave open uh, ten minutes for commercials at the sixty minute mark and the half half hour mark or something, and then they will put in all their commercials around that. So that would be barter. Because what you're basically doing is, is you're saying, OK, in, in the hour, I have this number of commercial spots, but I'll give you half of them. And you can sell them. And I'll keep the other half, and I'll sell them locally. So Isn't that clearance? Uh, clearance is where you, uh, as a local station, you agree to play everything that the network gives you. right? Versus here, this is a syndicated show. So it's all the same economics. It's all the same, like basically you're airing a show and you're selling advertising. But the thing is, you can sell 100% local advertising if you originate the program. Like Alice, basically, they hire the DJs, they hire the personalities, and so they sell all of those commercial minutes. You know, uh, If they go with syndicated programming, they could buy the program, and then they just put it in and they sell those commercial minutes. But more often than not, you do a cash barter. You pay them a little bit, but then you leave them a lot of advertising spots that they take over themselves. So that's the deal, basically, because the way everyone's making money is selling commercials. So uh, the way that they schedule this stuff makes the use of what's called a hot clock. Uh, so what this is, is this is a, a representation of an hour of programming on the radio. And it's kind of a template. 
So if you listen, if, I don't know if you get in your car anymore and turn on the radio at, let's say, 7.30 and you get to work at 8.30 or something like that, you will notice that the, the show, the station plays exactly the same, the same type of thing at the same times. The songs will change, the news will be different, but the times that it plays are going to be exactly the same. And that's because they use what's called a hot clock. Uh, which is also sometimes called a program wheel. So if this is an hour, what this means is that starting at 8 a.m., you'll hear an ID. You know, you're listening to KFOG, San Francisco. That's the legal ID. They have to put it in there somewhere. Someone can say it, or they can have like jingles and bzz, 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 or all that crap on it. You know. But then you'll get like five minutes of music, another five minutes of music. You'll get a promo for something coming up. You get more music, you'll get traffic on the 12s or traffic on the 10, and then you'll get some commercials, and then you'll get a promo, and then music, 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 and so on. And what is a little sweepers? Bit of uh, sweepers are uh, um, they're, they're, uh, basically a, a station imaging thing. So it's like a zzz type of, it's like a sound effect jingle type thing. So sweepers and liners are, are, are station imaging elements, just to keep people aware of what they're listening to. And the reason there's so many of those is because Nielsen takes the ratings every 15 minutes, right? And uh, in smaller markets, they're still asking people to fill in a diary. What were you listening to on Tuesday at 8 o'clock? So to hope that you will remember what you were listening to, they have to constantly tell you what channel you're on. Mm -hmm. So that's why there's so much of those ID type of things. So this basically would be now in a computer. And the program director would be choosing the songs that will go in there one after another, basically. Uh, so the template remains the same, uh, but they swap out stuff. And uh, this also connects to the broadcaster's understanding of what the audience is doing. Uh, so people tend to get to work. They're due at work either at 8.30 or at 9 o'clock. And your ratings are happening every 15 minutes. So what you're trying to do is to get someone to tune in and stay with you as long as possible through the first 15, the second 15, perhaps the third, perhaps the fourth. And so you schedule stuff uh, that when people drop in at the beginning of the hour because they're starting to tune in, you give them lots of music because that's what they want to hear. Uh, as you get to uh, you know, later in the time period, you've got to play commercials. And so they'll often sandwich them in either at, the, at, 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 a, at a different time. Uh, and they'll give you certain things to try to keep you listening past the 15 minute mark. So for instance, it'll be like, um, you know, uh, stay tuned. We're giving a couple of tickets away later on in the show, all right? Uh, and you maybe lay that on them just before you do a bunch of commercials as though it's coming up. And then you come back and, well, you're not giving away the tickets yet. You're going to promo that a little bit later on. Stay tuned because we're going to give away tickets at 840 or something like that. So they're trying to get you to stay with them past these breaks. Uh, and then, you know, the other understanding is that uh, so sooner or later, people are going to get out of the car to get to work. And so this doesn't show that. I guess it shows it. Well enough here, they'll start putting commercials in when they know people are going to tune out because they're, they're just arriving. If they work at 8.30, they're probably finished their drive by here. So our ratings will go down anyway. So stick a bunch of commercials in there, which usually makes people change the channel. Same thing if they've got to work at 9. You know, you can start loading in less attractive material as you get close to those marks. So that's some of the way that they understand their audience. And so they, they line things up with the hot clock based on that. This is maybe not a classic type of strategy, but it's pretty good. Yeah? That almost seems like they're defrauding their ad advertisers. Like how it's do part of the game. Yeah, how do they keep paying for it when it's structured like that? I, you know, I mean, the I don't think they follow it all that closely. And <clears throat> it's... Uh, it, it's, it comes down to about $900 a minute per radio advertising fees, which is pretty cheap compared to going on to TV. And so to reach the mobile audience, you know, to reach, to reach people in their cars, it's, it's basically radio. You know? And so then if you're looking for 
uh, consumers of a particular gender and age. That narrows down the number of stations. And so eventually, you know, you may be one of two or three stations that are competing for those advertisers. Um, and nonetheless, they, you know, the, the, the program, the, the commercials air, and uh, uh, they even make recordings of them so that they can, you know, prove to the advertisers that, yep, you, you can hear it. We recorded it. This went out on the air. So, um, that's, so that's, that's how they do it. Yeah, but it's true. There's a little bit of like, uh, you know, we'll, we'll sell you, we'll sell you the ad times, you know, and we'll sometimes they don't promise when they'll play them. Exactly. That's you know? what I'm yeah, they do. There's there's different formulas. Uh, you can, you know, if you pay top dollar, you can make sure you're in the morning or in the evening because these are the times when ratings are the highest. Uh, but you can also get dif <laughs> different different formulas which are just like run of station, which basically means they can play at any time uh, when they have a, an open spot. And it gets a lot cheaper. You know, it might be $900 in, in drive times, but it could be like $15 after midnight or something. It's really cheap. So there you go. So that's, that's kind of a crash, crash thing about radio, um, radio programming. So but the formats which draw particular audiences, and then the hot clock, which hour by hour tries to you know, maximize keeping the audience with you during those ratings periods. There's a lot in here about different types of TV programs, which, I mean, it might be fun to read. Um, and it might be useful uh, if you're drop, you know, doing that prompt about comparing the 60s to the 70s to the 80s or stuff like that. So you could check that out if you want. I guess talking a little bit more about, about syndication, um, we've got a maximum of about five minutes here. A little bit more about syndication as it works in television. So as I mentioned, you know, there's radio programs that are produced by private companies and then sold to individual radio stations, and those, those are called syndicated programs. Same thing exists in television. Even some of the big shows like Star Trek, the original Star Trek was a syndicated show. Um, so these are shows that are not created by networks. They're created by private production companies. And uh, they, they make the show, and then they sell the show through you know, different distributors. They're companies that specialize in distributing syndicated shows. What, what's a good syndicated? program or whatever. What's a good... Dr. Phil. Op Oprah was syndicated in her day before she became a cable channel. Most game shows? Most game shows, yeah. Almost all the game shows. Right? Uh, yeah. I would assume so, yeah. yeah. Even though it's on CBS? That's, yeah. Again, it could be on a CBS affiliate station, but it wouldn't be part of the CBS network program, <laughs> which is provided to the station. So every affiliate station has times a day where the network doesn't supply them the, 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 any programming. In fact, there's a law uh, which the, the, the network can only provide three hours of primetime programming, a maximum of that. So that would mean between 7 p.m. and 11 p.m., which is considered primetime, the network can only provide three hours in there. And that law was created in the 1970s to protect local stations from just being forced by their networks that they affiliate with to basically put like all of their programming to, to take it from the network. Why is that? It's because, again, when, when your CBS affiliate <coughs> shows the CBS network shows, they are splitting the advertising minutes around that. The network gets to sell some of those advertising minutes. The local station affiliate gets to sell some of those minutes, right? Mm -hmm. So that means throughout the day, you're splitting your profits with the network. Well, Congress felt it was, you know, the, the network was so powerful, they had to protect the local station, say, well, there's at least some hours during the day where you can do your own thing and take all the money. That turns out to be your local news, usually, which is the most profitable for those affiliate stations. So, you know, at those times, you're selling all of the ads, and you get good ratings for those local TV news hours. So there's actually a law about it. Um, so um, now, after 11, you may have your late night shows, you know, uh, your, your, your whatever. 
<laughs> whoever's on there now, uh, you know, yeah. Or you may have syndicated programming like reruns, like sitcoms that you put in from 11 till 12 or something like that. Um, and so uh, those have to come from somewhere. So there's two sources for those syndicated shows. Either they're old network shows uh, that are, you know, um, that Frasier's still on there, Seinfeld is still on there, uh, you know. Uh, so favorite old sitcoms do really well. And, and, and so those are called off-network syndicated shows. They started on a network, they were produced by NBC or CBS. They've finished their run, they go off the air after 12 seasons or something, and then they go into syndication and they sell them afterwards. So Seinfeld sells for almost a million dollars an episode. Still, you can imagine that they're, they're, you know, Jerry is rich, richer than rich, you know, based on that. Yeah. Uh, but not as rich as Julia Louis Dreyfus, right? Is Elaine? Yeah, she's because she, she was heir to a billionaire's fortune as well as being <laughs> like an incredibly successful comedian. Incredible. More power to her. Anyhow, so, uh, so, so those would be off network. They started on a network and now they're off the network. And they, but there's also um, original, original syndicated programs like Star Trek or like the game shows, which are profitable and they never started on a network. They're basically created by private companies and then they sell, you know, a, a, a syndicated distributor sells them to those individual stations. You need something at 11? You know, here, we got some Seinfeld reruns. Uh, you need something midday, two till four, we'll give you, you know, a Dr. Phil or something like that. And, and those are, you know, they, they are strong companies that make a lot of money. They don't want to necessarily be bought by a network or something like that. They're happy producing their show privately. Yeah. What's the uh, uh, proportion or percentage of uh, syndicated programs versus just they're made by networks? Couldn't tell you, but, but it's something to check out. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. But on a Fox station, it would be more. You know, and on a Cron, it would be much more because they're not affiliated with one of the big three networks. So they'll, they'll be using, you know, if they have any network affiliation at all, it'll have much less programming given to them which means they have to fill in with a lot more syndicated shows and locally originated news, which explains why Cron you know, is the way it is. Cool, okay, just a couple of minutes, five minutes for a Kahoot. <laughs> These days go fast, don't they? Join us in chat. A network schedules a new or weak program between two strong programs, what's that called? <clears throat> Only two answers? New program between two strong programs. So it looks like this, All right? All right. Bridge. All right. It is Amiking. All right, Amiking. Cool. Ten, ten people got it. Excellent. Next. The network programs place, uh, places four situation comedies into a two-hour time period. So four situation comedies in a two-hour time period. What's that one? Answers out there. Can you get any more? There we go. Ten people got blocking. It is blocking. So you're putting all these programs into a block. All right, next. The network programs a show so that it runs over the starting time of the next program. What's that one called? All right. And that is bridging. Everybody got that one right. Awesome. So I think we're pretty strong on these uh, concepts. Okay. ESPN is a what? Cash drain. Uh, is it a cable network? Is it a super station? Is it a broadcast network or a pay-per-view channel? And the right answer was number seven, a cable network. So when you were building out your cable bundles for that assignment, you must have seen that ESPN at over six dollars was the most expensive cable network out there for someone to carry. All right, let's head up to the next one. How I Met Your Mother, first broadcast on CBS, now in syndication reruns, is an example of what type of program? So first broadcast on CBS, so produced by CBS, but now in reruns. Can't you just set this with the Seinfeld? 
Number eight, off-network syndicated program, okay? So the terminology is not quite clear. It's not as obvious as it could be, but if it started on a network and then it moved off-network into a syndicated situation, it's an off-network syndicated program. To differentiate themselves, radio stations program music according to a specific what? All right, yes, everybody got it different formats. So what that means is in San Francisco, 45 commercial stations approximately. Imagine if they all had to go after the same advertisers. It would be horribly competitive. But if each of them has a different format, or let's say, you know, there are 10 formats out there with only three stations getting after a particular audience with their format, now you're only competing against two other stations instead of 40 other stations. So that's why formats have been so useful. A big reason radio, radio could reinvent itself in the late 50s was what? What helped them? What did they do to like reinvent themselves after all those other programs were taken by TV? Played. Absolutely, they went for rock and roll music. Okay, they went for music programs. And at that time, pop music was rock. Another name for the program wheel used to schedule radio shows is... Fortune. <laughs> That's good. Glad you enjoyed that. Glad you enjoyed that, JP. I was proud of myself this morning. So it is a hot clock, okay? So it's, they call it a clock because it's like an hour of programming. So it's a hot clock. Right. Very gratifying. A song played very often on music radio is said to be in heavy what? I didn't get to this, yeah. All right, the correct answer was rotation. So rotation refers to how often you play a song, the same song, in the schedule. So heavy rotation means you play it pretty often, which is like your top 40 stations, which play the same 10 songs over and over again. All right, non-commercial radio stations such as KQED, which is our public radio station here, they get underwriting rather than advertising. Is that true or false? Do you hear lots of ads on public radio? No. It is true. KQED will go for underwriting rather than advertising. All right. Thank you. That is the end of the hoop. Great job.